There is a grave danger of our making a wrong confession, a wrong affirmation. We confess our fears and doubts, that gives Satan dominion. We confess our sickness, and confession binds our will as a captive and holds us in absolute slavery. We confess want and lack of money, and want comes like an armed man and holds us in bondage. We confess lack of ability in the face of the fact that God said he was the strength of our life. These confessions of failure shut the Father out and let Satan in and give him the right of way. These confessions repudiate the word of God. They honor Satan. What should we confess? Psalm 23, 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I do not want. You're not afraid anymore, and you confess it. John 10, 29, My Father is greater than all. Our words imprison us, or they set us free. Our words put us in bondage, keep us from our freedom and our liberty in Christ. Malachi 3.13, your words have been stout against me, saith Jehovah. That's when our words war with his word. A woman came to me the other day. She said, I've been prayed for, but I get no deliverance. Her word contradicted the word of God. His word said, If ye shall ask anything of the Father, he will give it you in my name. Mark sixteen eighteen, They that believe shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. She repudiated it. She denied that the word was true. Her words were warring against the word of God. She had unconsciously taken an attitude of mind that was against the word. She did not intend to, but she had done it. That very attitude held her in bondage. As I talked with her, I could see that she was not taking in what I said. When I prayed for her, she was freed from pain. But the whine did not leave her voice. There was no confession of victory in her lips. There is always a danger of mental assent confession. Mental assent recognizes the truthfulness of the word, but never acts upon it. Its confession is, oh yes, there is healing in the word. There is salvation and deliverance in the word, but... On the other hand, faith joyfully confesses its victory. Its joy is a celebration. It is a triumph over the witnesses of the senses. Faith gives a sense of security, of absolute assurance of quietness and when this breaks forth in confession, it becomes a reality. The heart must be rooted and grounded in the word and in love. Acts 19.20, So mightily grew the word of the Lord and prevailed. Faith is simply the word prevailing over sense evidence. Acts 20.32 gives us a striking illustration. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It's the word that establishes. It's the word that builds. It's the word of his grace that builds faith in the heart of the believer. Jesus' confession demands more careful attention. John 5, 19 and 20, here are ten claims of Jesus. Every one of them puts him into the class of deity. Study them carefully. Underscore them in your Bible. John 5, 43, I came in my Father's name. John 5, 46. For if ye believed in Moses, ye would believe me. John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. This is a tremendous confession. John 6, 47. He that believeth hath eternal life. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. John 7, 29. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. John 8, 29. I do always the things that are pleasing to him. John 10, 10. I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he die, yet shall he live. These are a few of his confessions. Do we dare confess what we are in Christ and what we have in Christ? Dare we confess John 1, 16, Of his fullness have we all received, and grace upon grace? We have received his fullness, but it's done us no good, for we have failed to translate it into a confession. Every believer knows that God laid his diseases on Jesus, yet he fears to make the confession and act on the word. This fear is of the adversary. 
It indicates that we have more confidence in the adversary than we have in the Word of God. We confess that what he says is true. Then we demonstrate it in our daily life. There is no confession in the lives of many people. There is much prayer, but there is no confession that the Word is true. It is not prayer many need, but confession of the Word. I do not mean a confession of sin. A woman said recently after I had prayed for her and opened the Word to her, You will keep on praying for my disease, won't you? Her confession was that the Word was a lie. You are to confess that you can do what he says you can do, that you are what the Word says you are. He says that you are a new creation created in Christ Jesus. He says that you are more than a victor, that you are an overcomer. He made you to be a son, a daughter of God Almighty, an heir of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ. You can do all things in him who is your strength, Philippians 4.13. What he says I can do, I declare that I can do. What he says I am, I declare that I am. I make my confession boldly. You make your confession. God is my father. I am his child. As a son in his family, I am taking my place. I am acting my part. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. Remember that the Father will be to you what you confess him to be. If prayer is not answered, hold fast to your confession. If the name of Jesus does not give instant deliverance, hold fast your confession. If the money does not come, stand by your confession. Luke 1, no word from God is void of power. Isaiah 55, 11, the word must accomplish the will of the Father. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. There is a danger of praying then going back on your prayer. When you pray for some need and declare that the need is not met, you have repudiated your prayer. But prayer is answered. His word is real. Do not annul the word by negative confession. Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Another desperate enemy, and a persistent one, is wrong confession. What do I mean by wrong confession? You know that Christianity is really the great confession, Romans 10, verse 9, because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus is Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You notice it is a confession here with your lips. Whenever the word confession is used, we unconsciously think of sin. It's not confession of sin. It's a confession of our knowing that God's Son died for our sins, according to Scripture, and that the third day he was raised again. Now, with my mouth, I make confession of the lordship of that raised one. I not only do that, but with my heart, I have accepted his righteousness, and I make confession of my salvation. You see, there is no such thing as salvation without confession. So Hebrews 3, 1 becomes clear. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, even Jesus. You see, Christianity is our confession. Hebrews 4.14, he says, Let us hold fast our confession. What is our confession? Why, that God is our Father, we are his children, we are in his family. It's a confession that our Father knows what our needs are and has made provision to meet every one of them. It's a confession of the finished work of Christ of what I am in him and what he is in me. It's a confession that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It is my confession that my God does supply every need of mine according to his riches and glory. It's my confession that when I pray, the Father hears my prayer and answers me. This is a manifold confession. If I were sick, I would maintain my confession that by his stripes I am healed. If I were weak, I would insist upon this confession that God is now the strength of my life, and I can do all things in him who is enabling me with his own ability. 
If it's a problem of wisdom, I confess that Jesus has been made unto me wisdom from God. Here are some don'ts. Don't try to believe. Just act on the word. Don't have a double confession so that one moment you confess, Yes, he heard my prayer. I am healed. Or, I will get the money. And then begin to question how it's going to come and what you ought to do to get it. Your latter confession destroys prayer and destroys faith. Do your own believing. Have your own faith as you have your own clothes. Act on the word for yourself. Don't talk doubt or unbelief. Never admit that you are a doubting Thomas. That's an insult to your father. Don't talk about sickness and disease. Never talk about failure. Talk about the word, its absolute integrity, and of your utter confidence in it, of your ability to act on it, and hold fast to your confession of its truthfulness. What I confess, I possess. It took me a long time to see this truth. After I saw it and thought I understood it, I still couldn't act upon it. Christianity is called the great confession. The law of that confession is that I confess I have a thing before I consciously possess it. Romans 10, 9 and 10 gives you the law for entering the household of faith. Because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, with the heart the man believes that Jesus is his righteousness, and with his lips he makes a confession of his salvation. You notice that confession of the lips comes before God acts upon our spirits and recreates them. I say, Jesus died for my sins according to Scripture, and I now acknowledge him as my Lord. And I know that the instant I acknowledge him as my Lord, I have eternal life. I cannot have eternal life until I confess that I have it. I confess that I have salvation before God acts and recreates me. The same thing is true in regard to healing. I confess that by his stripes I am healed, and the disease still is in my body. I say, surely he has borne my sicknesses and carried my pains, and I have come to appreciate him as the one who was stricken, smitten of God with my diseases, and now I know that by his stripes I am healed. Now that's a literal translation. I make the confession that by his stripes I am healed. The disease and its symptoms may not leave my body at once, but I hold fast to my confession. I know that what he has said, he is able to make good. I know that I am healed because he said I was healed. And it makes no difference what the symptoms may be in my body. I laugh at them, and in the name of Jesus, I command the author of disease to leave my body. He is defeated, and I am a victor. I have learned this law that when I boldly confess then and then only do I possess. I make my lips do their work. I give the word its place. God has spoken and I side with the word. If I side with the disease and the pain, there is no healing for me. But I take sides with the word and I repudiate the disease and sickness. My confession gives me possession. I want you to note this fact. Faith is governed by our confession. If I say I have been prayed for and I'm waiting now for God to heal me, I have repudiated my healing. My confession should be this. The Word declares that I am healed, and I thank the Father for it, and I praise Him for it, because it is a fact. You remember Philippians 4, 6, and 7? In nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Why must prayer be made with thanksgiving? That means that I know the thing is done. I ask for it, and now I have it. So I thank the Father for it. The seventh verse says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will fill my heart. I'm not worrying any longer. I have it. 
I'm not going to get the money I need. I have it. It's just as real as though it were in my pocket. I'm not going to get my healing. I have my healing because I have his word, and my heart is filled with rapture. I have God's word for it. Your confession solves the problem. A wrong confession hinders the Spirit's work in your body. A neutral confession is unbelief. It's just as bad as a negative confession. It is the positive, clear-cut confession that wins. I know in whom I have believed. I know that no word from God is void of power or fulfillment. I know that he watches over his word to make it good. These are the confessions of a victor. I want you to notice several facts about the relation of confession to faith. Your confession is your faith. If it be a neutral confession, you have neutral faith. If it's a negative confession, it's unbelief dominating your spirit. Unbelief grows with a negative confession. A confession of failure puts failure on the throne. If I confess weakness, weakness dominates me. If I confess my sickness, I am held in bondage by it. These negative confessions are acknowledgments of Satan's dominion over God's tabernacle. Your spirit always responds to your confession. Faith is not a product of the reasoning faculties, but of the recreated spirit. When you were born again, you received the nature of the Father God. That nature grows in you with your acting on the word and your confession of the Father's perfect dominion in your body causes your spirit to grow in grace and ability. You remember that your confession is your present attitude toward the Father. In some special testing that may come to you, your confession is either in the realm of faith or in the realm of unbelief. Your confession either honors the Father or Satan, either gives Satan or the Word dominance in your life. Now you can see the value of holding fast to your confession. Your confession either makes you a conqueror or it defeats you. You rise or fall to the level of your confession. Learn to hold fast to your confession in the hard places. John 8, 36. If the Son has made you free, you're free indeed. The Son has made you free. Now stand fast in that liberty. Galatians 5, 1 is of vital importance to every believer. For freedom did Christ set us free. Stand fast, therefore. The time to make your confession is when Satan attacks you. You feel the pain coming in your body. You repudiate it. You command it to leave in the name of Jesus. Romans 8, 31 through 37. If God is for us, who is against us? Your Father is for you. Disease cannot conquer you, nor can the author of disease. Circumstances cannot master you, because the Father and Jesus are greater than any circumstances. You have learned that in whatsoever circumstance or condition you are, to rejoice in your continual victory. You know that 1 John 4, 4 is true. Ye are of God, my little children, and have overcome them. Notice who you are. You are of God. You are born of God. You are a product of His, and of His own will He brought you forth through the Word. The rest of the verse reads, Greater is He that is in you, than he that is in the world. For it is God who is at work within you, willing and working his own good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 has been my victory many times. Now turn to Romans 8.11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead shall give life also to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwelleth in you. You must recognize this fact. All is yours by confession, or all is lost by a negative confession. You get God's best by the confession that you have it. The secret of faith is the secret of confession. Faith holds the confession that he has the thing he desires before he actually possesses it. Sense knowledge faith confesses that he is healed when the pain leaves and the swelling goes down. There is really no faith in that. Faith declares you are healed while the pain is still racking your body. Let me state it again. Possession comes with confession. Possession stays with continual confession. You confess that you have it, and you thank the Father for it, and then realization follows. Remember, 
Confession with thanksgiving always brings realization. Confession is the melody of faith. Confession before realization is foolishness to sense knowledge. Abraham's faith was contrary to sense evidence. He waxed strong, giving glory to God, knowing that what God promised he would make good. Sense knowledge has no real faith in the word. John 17, 23, that they may know that thou lovest them even as thou lovest me. Philemon, verse 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. God has shown me a great faith secret here. My faith will become effective, that is, get things from God, by my acknowledging of every good thing which is in me in Christ Jesus. Acknowledging is confessing or affirming the good things which are in me in Christ Jesus. This harmonizes with Romans 10.10, 10, that what I confess I possess. These good things I acknowledge that are within me are not my own attainments, but what I have in Christ Jesus. All things are mine in Christ. Of his fullness have I received. One of the devil's subtle devices, of which I am not ignorant, lest he get an advantage of me, is to cause me to focus attention upon my past sins, my failures, my weaknesses, my mistakes. I will resist the devil, and he will flee from me by thus saith the Lord. My faith is set on fire by acknowledging every good thing which is in me in Christ Jesus. It's acknowledging my possessions in Christ. What shall I acknowledge? That I am who God says I am. That I have what God says I have. That I can do what God says I can do. I know that I go to the level of my confession. If it's a negative confession, acknowledging only the bad, rather than the good things in me in Christ, I will go to the level of defeat, failure, weakness, and lack. But I refuse to do that. I shall acknowledge the good things I possess in Christ, and thereby my faith is dynamic, effective, on fire, gets things from God. The effective faith I now have, by acknowledging every good thing which is in me, in Christ Jesus, hallelujah. An affirmation is a statement of fact or a supposed fact. Faith and unbelief are built out of affirmations. The affirmation of a doubt builds unbelief. An affirmation of faith builds strength to believe more. When you affirm that the word of God cannot be broken, you affirm that the word and God are one, that when you trust in the Word, you are trusting in God the Father. You affirm to your own heart that behind the Word is the throne of God, that the integrity of God is interwoven into the pattern of His Word. Abraham counted that God was able to make good all that he promised. God did make good on his promise to Abraham. The amazing thing is that he took a man 100 years old and renewed his body, making it young again. He took a woman 90 years old and made her young, beautiful, and so attractive that a king fell in love with her. She gave birth to a beautiful boy after she was 90 years old. It was not Sarah's faith, it was Abraham's faith that made this woman young. Doubt was a part of her life. She voiced her unbelief in a statement, and the angel heard her and reprimanded her for it. Genesis 18:12. She retreated in fear from the angel as unbelief always makes us retreat. When you constantly affirm that Jesus is the surety of the new covenant and that every word from Matthew to Revelation can be utterly depended upon, then that word in your lips is God speaking. When you say what God told you to say, then it is as though Jesus were saying it. When you remember that the word never grows old, is never weak, never loses its power, but is always the living word, the life-giving word, the sustaining word, the Satan-defeating word, and you boldly confess it, then it becomes a living thing in your lips. When you confess that Satan has no ability to break the seal of the blood, and that by the blood they overcame the adversary, and by the word of their testimony, you gain the ascendancy. When you openly affirm his word is what it confesses to be, the word of God, 
that his word is your contract as well as your contract with him, then the word becomes a living reality in your daily life. Your word can become one with God's word. His word can become one with your word. His word abiding in you gives you an authority in heaven. That's a thrilling fact. John 15, 7, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you. The words of your lips are the words that abide in you and dominate you. This visible word gives faith in the unseen word sitting at the right hand of God. The word you have in your hand carries you beyond sense knowledge into the very presence of God and gives you a standing there. We're continually affirming something, and that affirmation and the reactions of the affirmation upon our lives are sometimes very disastrous. You know the effects of words of loved ones have upon you. Well, the effect of your own words upon you is just as strong. You continually say, well, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I haven't the strength to do it. And you feel your physical energy and your mental efficiency oozing away and leaving you weak and full of indecision and doubt, and your efficiency is gone. You see, an affirmation is the expression of our faith. Whether we have faith in ourselves, in loved ones, in the Bible or its author, or whether we have faith in disease, failure, and weakness. Some people are always confessing their faith in diseases, their faith in failure and calamity. You'll hear them confessing that their children are disobedient and that their husband or wife is not doing what's right. They constantly confess failure and doubts. They little realize that that confession robs them of their ability and efficiency. They little realize that that confession can change the solid, hard road into a boggy, clogged mire. But it is true. The confession of weakness will bind and hold you in captivity. Talk poverty, and you'll have plenty of it. Confess your wants, your lack of money all the time, and you will always have a lack. Your confession is the expression of your faith, and these confessions of lack and of sickness shut the Father God out of your life and let Satan in, giving him the right of way. Confessions of failure give disease and failure dominion over your life. They honor Satan and rob God of his glory. Here are a few good confessions. The Lord is my shepherd, I do not want. You say this in the face of the fact that want has been your master. A new master has taken over the kingdom, and you whisper it softly at first, The Lord is my shepherd. Then you say it a little stronger, The Lord is my shepherd. You keep repeating it until it dominates you. When this becomes true in your life, you will never say again, I want or I need but you will say, I have. He that believeth hath. Believing is having. Hear you whisper, My Father is greater than all. What a confession that is. My Father is greater than want, greater than disease, greater than weakness, greater than any enemy that can rise against me. Then you say with deliberate confidence, God is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is my strength. How much strength have I? God is the measure of it. There are two types of affirmations that I wish you to notice. First, there is the affirmation with nothing behind it but my own will to make it good. It's based upon a philosophy born of sense knowledge. That sense knowledge is a product of my own mind. If it be in regard to sin, I deny the existence of it. If it be in regard to sickness, I deny that sickness has any existence. We see this in Christian science. If it's a problem of ability to meet a financial obligation, I affirm with all my might that I have the ability to meet it. And all that I have to make these affirmations good is something that I am or have of myself. The Word of God has no place in this affirmation. I cannot say that greater am I than disease, or greater am I than this demand upon me. Consequently, my affirmation becomes a failure. The second type of affirmation is based upon the Word of God. The Word says, if God be for you, who can be against you? I know that he's for me. 
I know that this disease that was laid upon me has been defeated, that it was actually laid upon Christ, and by his stripes I am healed. That affirmation is based upon the word of God, upon the word that liveth and abideth and cannot be broken. Jesus said, Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will never pass away. You see the vast difference between an affirmation based upon your own will or philosophy and an affirmation backed up by God himself? The affirmation based upon sense knowledge philosophy have no more value or ability to make good than is in the will and mind of the maker of the affirmation. But the affirmation that is based upon the living word has God back of it to make it good. Claiming the promises is not faith. Faith already has it. Claiming proves that one doesn't have it yet. It's unbelief attempting to act like faith. As long as one is trying to get it, faith has not yet acted. Faith says, thank you, Father. Faith has it. Faith has arrived. Faith stops praying and begins to praise. Notice carefully. Doubt says, I claim the promises. I am standing on the promises. This is all the language of doubt. Unbelief quotes the word but does not act upon it. We call this mental assent. I can remember in those early days how we used to plead the promises and claim them as ours. We didn't know that our very language savored of unbelief. You see, believing is simply acting on the word. We act on the word as we would act on the word of a loved one. We act on the word because we know that it is true. We do not try to believe it. We do not pray for faith. We simply act upon it. One said to me the other day, I'm trying to make the word true. I said, I don't see why you need to do that because it's always been true. People do not know the word until they begin to practice it and let it live in them. They may have sat under one of the finest teachers or preachers in the country for years yet it has never become a part of their lives. Using the word in your daily life is the secret of faith. The word abides in you and enables him to express himself through you. You draw on the vine life for wisdom, love, and ability. You're never without resources. The word is the master speaking to you. When you act on the word, you're acting in unison with him. You and he are lifting the load together. He is fellowshipping with you, sharing with you, you're sharing his ability and strength. Now you can understand that all faith is, is acting on the word. We're through with sense knowledge formulas. Now we're walking with him, realizing that his ability has become ours. Psalm 50, 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Words of praise glorify the Lord. I shall be a bold praiser, one who praises the Lord. My resolve, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. As a praiser, I extol the Lord, not so much for his gifts I receive, but I magnify the wonderful giver himself. Words spoken in harmony with God's word work wonders too. I shall order my conversation aright. No corrupt word shall proceed out of my mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Words of confession of God's word indeed work wonders. My confession always precedes my possession. The word confession means to say the same thing. I dare to say exactly what God says in his word. I agree with God by speaking his word in all circumstances. How can I talk sickness when the Bible says with his stripes we are healed? How can I talk weakness when the Bible says the Lord is the strength of my life? How can I talk defeat when the Bible says we are more than conquerors through Christ? How can I talk lack when the Bible says my God shall supply all my need? How can I talk bondage when the Bible says the Son has made me free? When I order my words aright, God manifests to me the benefits of his great salvation. Romans 10.10, 10, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
With my mouth I make confession unto salvation, which includes healing, deliverance, and every spiritual and physical blessing provided for us in Christ. By words I overcome Satan. I know also that words can work blunders. Most of our troubles are tongue troubles. A negative confession precedes possession of wrong things. With the mouth confession is made unto sickness, defeat, bondage, weakness, lack, and failure. I refuse to have a bad confession. My words work wonders, words of praise, words confessing God's word, words of bold authority expelling satanic power, words of singing, yes, words are the coin of the kingdom. I boldly speak words that work wonders. It is necessary that there be a continual confession of our redemption from Satan's dominion, and that he no longer rules us with condemnation nor fear of disease. We hold fast to this confession, as our confession is Satan's defeat. We believers do not ask to be healed, because we have been healed. We do not ask to be made righteous, because we have been made righteous. We do not ask to be redeemed, for our redemption is an absolute fact. In the mind of the Father, we are perfectly healed and perfectly free from sin because he laid our diseases and our sins upon his Son. His Son was made sin with our sin. He was made sick with our diseases. In the mind of Christ, we are perfectly healed because he can remember when he was made sin with our sins, when he was made sick with our diseases. He remembers when he put our sin and our diseases away. In the mind of the Holy Spirit, we are absolutely free from both. For he remembers when Christ was made sin and when he was made sick. He remembers when he raised Jesus from the dead. Christ was free from our sin and our sickness. Both had been put away before his resurrection. The word declares that by his stripes we were healed. The whole problem is our recognition of the absolute truthfulness of that word. It's not good taste to ask him to heal us for he has already done it. This truth came with a shock when I first saw it. He declared that we are healed, therefore we are. The only problem now is to get in perfect harmony with his word. If he declares we're healed, then our part is to thank him for the work he's already accomplished. Our confession imprisons us or sets us free. A strong confession coupled with a corresponding action on the word brings God on the scene. Holding fast to one's confession when the senses contradict shows that one has become established in the Word. A Satan-inspired confession is always dangerous. Remember that he brought that disease, put it upon you. Your acknowledgement of the disease is like signing for a package that the express company has left you. Satan then has the receipt for your disease. You have accepted it. Surely he hath borne our sickness and carried our diseases is God's receipt for our perfect healing. A positive confession dominates circumstances, while a vacillating confession permits circumstances to govern one. Your confession is what God says about your disease. A negative confession will make the disease stronger. Then your confession heals or keeps you sick. The confession of your lips should have your heart's full agreement. Our faith is measured by our confession. Our usefulness in the Lord's work is measured by our confession. Sooner or later, we become what we confess. There is the confession of our heart and the confession of our lips. When the confession of our lips perfectly harmonizes with the confession of our hearts, and these two confessions confirm God's word, then we become mighty in our prayer life. Many people have a negative confession. They're always telling what they are not, telling of their weakness, of their failings, of their lack of money, of their lack of ability, of their lack of health. Invariably, they go to the level of their confession. A spiritual law that few of us have recognized is that our confessions rule us. When we confess His Lordship and our hearts fully agree, then we turn our lives over into His care. That is the end of worry the end of fear, the beginning of faith. When we believe that he arose from the dead for us, 
and that by his resurrection he conquered the adversary and put him to naught for us, when this becomes the confession of our lips and our hearts, we become a power for God. If we have accepted him as our Savior and confessed him as our Lord, we are new creations. We have eternal life. We have the position of sons. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The moment that we recognize the fact of his actual resurrection, then we know that the sin problem is settled. We know that Satan has been eternally defeated for us. We know that we are in union with deity. We know that we have come into the family of God. We know that the ability of God has become ours. This may not dawn on us all at once, but as we study the word and act upon it, live in it and let it live in us, it becomes slowly perhaps, but surely a living reality. That reality is developed through our confession. We confess his lordship and we declare before the world that he is our shepherd and that we do not want. We confess that he makes us to lie down in green pastures and that he leads us beside the waters of stillness. We confess that he has restored our souls to a sweet, wonderful fellowship with him. We confess that he has made us new creations, that old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new, and that we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. We confess fearlessly before the world our utter oneness and union with him. We declare that he is the vine and we are the branches, that the branches and the vine are one. We declare that we are partakers of the divine nature that dwelt in him as he walked in Galilee. These are our confessions. We have come to know that Satan is defeated, that demons are subject to the name of Jesus in our lips, that disease cannot exist in the presence of the living Christ in us. Now we dare act on what we know the Word teaches. We dare to take our place and confess before the world that what the Word says about us is true. We're done with the confession of failure, of weakness, of inability, because God has become our ability. God has become our sufficiency, and He has made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant. We confess that He has taken us out of the old realm where failure reigned, into the new realm of victory, joy, and peace. As we make our confession and act on the word, our faith grows and our redemption becomes a reality. Jesus said, For I spake not from myself, but the Father that sent me. He hath given me a commandment, what I should speak. John twelve forty nine. Every healing that Jesus performed was wrought through his Father's word. Every word that he spoke was the Father's word. Jesus knew who he was. He knew his place. He knew his work. He was always positive in his message. He knew the words that he spoke were his Father's words. He took his place as a son. He acted his part. He continually confessed his sonship. Jesus always confessed what he was. He said, I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. God is my Father. I am the light of the world. In John 5, 19 through 30, Jesus makes 10 statements about himself. They're really confessions, and every one of them links him up with deity. He was speaking his Father's own word. John 7, 29, I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. He not only confessed what he was, but he also fearlessly confessed what man could be after he became a new creation. John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. John 7, 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What a confession that was, and how real it became on the day of Pentecost. John eight fifty four. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father that glorifieth me, of whom ye say that he is your God, and ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be like unto you, a liar. But I know him, and keep his word. John seventeen five. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That was a remarkable testimony. John 17, 26, And I made known unto them thy name, and will make it known, 
Jesus knew the name that God was to receive. John 17, 6, I manifested thy name unto the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. I have a conviction that the new name which Jesus speaks of here is Father. No one had ever called him Father before. John 9, 35 and 36, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and finding him, he said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, And who is he, Lord, that I may believe on him? Jesus then confessed who he really was. In the 37th verse, Jesus said to the man who had been blind, Thou hast both seen him, and he it is that speaketh with thee. Jesus openly declared that he was the Son of God. In John 4:26, we have another startling confession. He was talking with the woman of Samaria, and he confessed that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus knew who he was. Nearly every miracle that Jesus performed was performed with Father's words in Jesus' lips. Jesus was the revealed will of the Father. John 4, 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to accomplish his work. John 5, 30, I seek not mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, 38, I am come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 8, 29, For I do always the things that are pleasing to him. What a picture of the Master! He had no personal ambitions, no personal ends to achieve. He was simply doing the will of his Father, unveiling the Father until he could say, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John 14, 9. The less worldly ambitions we have, the less worldly desires, the more fully the Father will unveil himself to us. His words in our lips will perform the same acts that his words performed in Jesus' lips. Self-seeking limits one. The selfish man is a limited man. He who lives in the Word and lets the Word live in him, he who practices the Word and acts upon it, is the one who reveals the Father. When we act upon the Word, we unveil the Father. Let's review some facts. Few of us realize that our confession imprisons us. The right kind of confession will set us free. It's not only our thinking, it's our words, our conversation that builds power or weakness into us. Our words are the coins in the kingdom of faith. Our words snare us and hold us in captivity, or they set us free and become powerful in the lives of others. It is what we confess with our lips that really dominates our inner being. We unconsciously confess what we believe. If we talk sickness, it's because we believe in sickness. If we talk weakness and failure, it's because we believe in weakness and failure. It's surprising what faith people have in wrong things. They firmly believe in cancer, ulcers of the stomach, tuberculosis, and other incurable diseases. Their faith in that disease rises to the point where it utterly dominates them, rules them. They become its absolute slaves. They get the habit of confessing their weakness, and their confession adds to the strength of their weakness. They confess their lack of faith, and they're filled with doubts. They confess their fear, and they become more fearful. They confess their fear of disease, and the disease grows under the confession. They confess their lack, and they build up a sense of lack, which gains the supremacy in their lives. When we realize that we'll never rise above our confession, we're getting to the place where God can really begin to use us. Confess that by his stripes you are healed. Hold fast to your confession, and no disease can stand before you. Whether we realize it or not, we're sowing words just as Jesus said in Luke 8, 11. The seed is the word of God. The sower went forth to sow, and the seed he was sowing was the word of God. That's the seed we should sow. Others are sowing sense knowledge seeds of fear and doubt. It's when we confess the word of God, declare with emphasis that by his stripes I am healed, or my God supplies every need of mine and hold fast to our confession that we see our deliverance. Our words beget faith or doubt in others. Revelation 12:11 declares, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, and because of the word of their testimony. They overcame him with the word of God that was in their testimony. They conquered the devil with words. Most of the sick that Jesus healed during his ministry were healed with words. God created the universe with words, faith-filled words. Jesus said, 
thy faith has made thee whole. He said to dead Lazarus, Come forth! His words raised the dead. Satan is overcome by words. He is whipped by words. Our lips become the means of transportation of God's deliverance from heaven to man's need here on earth. We use God's word. We whisper, in Jesus' name, demon, come out of him. Jesus said, in my name you shall cast out demons. In my name you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. All with words. It is the word that heals. Jesus said, whatsoever you demand in my name, that will I do. In the Greek, the word ask is demand. We are demanding just as Peter did at the beautiful gate when he said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Words healed that man. Now we make our confession of words. We hold fast to our confession. We refuse to be defeated in our confession. John eight thirty two, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Or John eight thirty six. If therefore the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. We know that the Son has set us free, and we confess it. Jesus is the high priest of our confession. Christ conquered the enemies of humanity, Satan, sin, sickness, fear, death, and want. He made them captive, and he set us free. Hebrews 4.14 tells us to hold fast to the confession of our faith. Having then a great high priest, who hath passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. That confession is faith speaking. It is our victory over the enemy. It is our confidence. Colossians 2, 5 in one of our translations reads, For although, as you say, I am absent from you in body, yet in spirit am I present with you, and am delighted to witness your good discipline and the solid front presented by your faith in Christ. That solid front means continual confession of victory. We never confess anything but victory. Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers which fought against him and put them to an open shame. This is Colossians 2, 15 from Coney Bear's translation. We should stop making the wrong kind of confession and began at once to learn how to confess and what to confess. We should begin to confess that we are what he says we are and hold fast to that confession in the face of every contrary evidence. We refuse to be weak or acknowledge a weakness. We refuse to have anything to do with wrong confession. We are what he says we are. We hold fast to that confession with a fearless consciousness that God's word can never fail. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired is my confession and should be the confession of every person suffering with infirmity, disease, sickness, illness. In Luke 13, 16, we read this account in the words of Jesus. He said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? My attitude toward sickness and disease is this. I rebel in Jesus' name against the bonds of the devil. The Bible doesn't call my sickness a blessing. The Bible calls my sickness a bond, a bondage of the devil, and from every bond, I ought to be loose, said Jesus. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired because I have every right to be healed. It costs my Lord dearly to take upon himself my infirmities and sicknesses. I rebelled against sickness with these words, Get thee behind me, devil, for thus it is written, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. I have every right to be healed because of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ himself. The only reason worthy of basing my faith for healing is what Jesus has provided for me. His blood alone qualifies me for healing. My right to receive from God is based on the blood. I rebel against Satan's trespassing of God's property by this declaration, Satan, get thee hence, for thus it is written, I was made nigh to God by the blood of Christ. I rebel against this rebel, the devil, because I have a right to be healed, because of how 
his word reveals my rights. It's not based on how good or sincere I've been, but because of those bleeding stripes. I rebel by speaking these words, Devil, be thou gone, for thus it is written, With his stripes we are healed. I'm not ignorant of Satan's devices, and I've learned by the Holy Spirit to discern his work of oppression against me. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, so I overcome his works by the blood of Jesus and the word in my testimony. I rebel against this thief by these words, Devil, I resist you in Jesus' name, for I am depending entirely on the merits of Jesus Christ, by whose stripes I am healed. I shall stand my ground fearlessly in receiving my healing in the name of Jesus. Never again will I be the devil's dumping ground for his foul spirits of oppression. I rebel by this statement of authority. Devil, the blood of Jesus defeats you, and I resist you because it is written, The anointing shall destroy the yoke. Isaiah 53, 5, With his stripes we are healed. This prophecy given to Isaiah was concerning our Lord Jesus Christ and the bleeding wounds he was to endure to provide for his people. It's a finished work. Jesus has endured the striping. No matter what symptoms are present, by his stripes I'm healed. I confess this fact in the presence of symptoms that would contradict. But 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Regardless of others' opinions about my health, by his stripes I am healed. Others may think I look badly. They may pass their opinion about my state of health. But the truth prevails. By his stripes I am healed. In spite of past experiences, by his stripes I am now healed. I may have sought for healing before that was not manifested, but this is a new day for me. By his stripes I am healed. When pain strikes my body, by his stripes I am healed. It may be true that pain is there in my body, but I know greater truth. By his stripes I am healed. When things appear all wrong in health condition, his truth still prevails that by his stripes I am healed. When things appear all right and my health examinations are solid, it's because by his stripes I am healed. Wherever I am, regardless how I feel, I hold fast my joyful confession of his truth, by his stripes I am healed. 1 Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Joel 3.10 Let the weak say, I am strong. That's my confession. I am strong. This is the paradox of faith, to say I am strong when I am weak. This is faith's confession. I am strong. No matter what I think of myself, I am strong. Regardless of others' opinions about my life, I am strong. When I feel the weakest, I am strong. In spite of past experiences of succumbing to weakness, I rise up with a new testimony of faith. I am strong. It's not just when I feel strong that I say I am strong but it's when I even feel weak that I declare I am strong. God commands me to say, I am strong. So I say what God says about my life. This is the language of faith. This is the language of victory. Who am I? I am strong. Whatever else I may be, I am strong. Wherever I am, I am strong. What I confess, I possess. What I say is what I get. I confess I am strong and I possess strength. Why can I be so sure? Not only in Joel 3.10, but in countless other scriptures. God declares that he is my strength, so I gladly obey his command and say it. I am strong. Never do I say I am weak. This would be disobedience to my God. It would grieve the Holy Spirit. So listen again to Joel 3.10. Let the weak say I am strong. What are you fearing? Are you afraid of an untimely death? Are you afraid of a heart attack? Is your fear of cancer? Do you have a fear of some calamity? Do you fear the loss of the affection of your loved ones? Do you have a dreaded fear of flying in an airplane? Is the fear of man prevalent in your life? If there is any fear in your heart, I must be freed from it. You must be freed from it. 
Fear is an actual spirit that moves from without to take up occupancy within your life. Satan takes advantage of your giving place to fear and sees that the thing which you fear is reproduced in your life. Job 3.25 For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. When Job made this confession, he was on the ash heap of great suffering with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He had lost his family, his earthly possessions. Job evidently had entertained this fear for a long time by his admission that the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. What am I fearing? I must expel every spirit of fear from my life, or else that negative, tormenting fear can reproduce into my life the very thing which I fear. The Bible description of fear is not pleasant. It describes fear as tormenting, soul-snaring, the spirit of bondage, and able to reproduce itself in misery. Luke 1, 74 tells of a purpose of Christ coming to this world. We, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear all the days of our life. That means every day we ought to be free from fear. In the Bible, there's a verse against fear for every day of the year. And now, in the name of Jesus, we take bold action by speaking these words against fear. You satanic spirit of fear that is oppressed and vexed, I command you in Jesus' name to depart from this life, because it is written, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind.